First, our top story this hour, striking a deal. President Trump announcing yesterday that, quote, a monumental trade agreement between the U.S. and China could be finalized within the next four weeks, but has no plans yet for a much-anticipated summit with Chinese President Xi Jinping. The progress follows days of intense negotiations between Washington and Beijing. Ending yesterday with an Oval Office meeting between President Trump and the Chinese Vice Premier. The president said the proposed deal with China will cover all bases, including agriculture, technology, and IP theft. Joining me right now in a first on Fox interview is the Secretary of State of the United States, Mike Pompeo. Mr. Secretary, it's always a pleasure to see you. Great to be with you this Thank morning. Thank you so much Mary. for joining us. The IP theft issue is something we've spoken about before. How do you change something that's really ingrained in a country's culture? Do you think the U.S. is going to be able to come up with some kind of an enforcement mechanism to put in place so that the Chinese keep their promises of not stealing from the West? Yeah, Maria, this is a challenge. It's why the negotiations have taken as long as they have and why we're not complete yet. President Trump has for the first time called out China for this uh, theft of intellectual property. Uh, hundreds of billions of U.S. dollars uh, stolen by the Chinese over the past decades. President Trump is addressing it. Uh, the, the work that's being done is about this enforcement mechanism. What is it you do if they don't live up to the word? We've seen the Chinese enter into deals before where they didn't follow through. And the, the mission that uh, Secretary Mnuchin, uh, Ambassador Lighthizer have is to get this deal done in a way that uh, after the deal is done, after the signing ceremony, American companies can count on the fact they can do business in China without substantial risk, their IP will be stolen. And if it is, they will have a tool to recover for that loss. And, th and that's why the president has been using tariffs as, as the leverage. As a proxy, as, a, as leverage, uh, yes, to, to get them to come to the table and take seriously this fundamental obligation for engaging in commerce with the American uh, business community and with American citizens. And there's more to it. I mean, we're trying to do a deal with a country that is just absolutely the opposite of our culture, right? I mean, when you look at the human rights abuses, for example, in China, talk to us a bit about this police state that they have created in terms of, for example, rounding up Chinese Muslims. Um, you know, they're saying that it's for vocational training, and yet there are officers with guns and barbed wire ar around these vocational training centers for Muslims. Maria, there's a long history of China not abiding by its constitution, which says people can practice their faith. And China's own constitution. Uh, and yet today they've rounded up uh, close to a million Muslims, uh, Uyghurs, uh, in one part of their country, uh, treating them horribly. They say they're re-education camps, but they frankly won't let people in to see what's truly going on there. Uh, very limited access to this. Uh, I met with uh, four Uyghurs last week in my office. Uh, one these of them, are survivors of these, these, these camps are, or whatever so, you want to call Some of them were survivors. Some of them have family members in those camps. One of them, after our meeting, uh, had his aunt and uncle rounded up and taken to a camp in China. This is this is the kind of thing that they do to impact his behavior. His he's, he's here in America to impact his behavior here in America. It's unacceptable. They need to let this aunt and uncle. His mother is in a camp as well. She needs to get her U.S. passport back. Uh, this this kind of behavior. These human rights abuses are, are tragic. They're historic. And President Trump is taking on each of these challenges. So, so is this part of the discussions in terms of this near-term trade deal? What's the discussion with the Chinese in terms of the broader issues, not necessarily a quid pro quo on a trade deal? So, so the trade deal has its own conversation, its own dialogue that's taking place, but it's against the background of all of these other broader issues, uh, issues with uh, China's use of technology in ways that will fundamentally put Americans at risk. This technology from Huawei that is now being put in place uh, all across the world. It's a company that's very close to the Chinese government and will do what the Chinese government asks it to do. Uh, and so we have sounded the alarm, uh, urging uh, nations, uh, security apparatuses from around the world not to put this technology in. The, the challenges with China are manifold, and we're approaching each of them, uh, sometimes in separate silos, but often as part of a broader conversation with China, asking them to engage uh, in trade and conduct and human rights um, and in human rights activities that are consistent with the values that Americans hold dear. Yeah, and when you came back from your Europe trip, which was really a, an important trip when you were in Poland, we talked about this and how mm -hmm. you were getting a little pushback from the European nations. You broke news on this program when you said, look, we will be forced to share less information with those countries that are using Huawei Telecom. What's your uh, take on what Italy has done, signing a memorandum of understanding with China? I understand that may not include technology and telecom. What
What's your take on China's relationship with Italy? So I was with the Italian foreign minister yesterday. He was in town for the celebration of NATO's uh, 70th anniversary. Uh, and we had a conversation about this. Uh, I think each of the European countries, including Italy, is working its way through this problem set. I think they now have become aware of the risk to their own people, uh, not only directly from the technology, but the risk that America won't be able to work as closely with them, something they often count on and depend upon. Uh, I think what we'll see is we'll see European countries begin to take this threat very seriously, and I think we'll make real progress at protecting citizens around the world from the threat of Chinese surveillance state, Chinese technology inside of these networks. Look, I mean, the world wants to get into China. We know that, right? 1.4 billion people, they want a chance to sell to, their, to their, those consumers. But there are real risks here. So is that understanding, that partnership between Italy and China, does that exclude telecom? Does that exclude technology? So I don't know the details okay. of what's in their agreement. Uh, it is the case. Marie, we want to trade with China, too. I want yeah, American exactly. businesses to thrive and flourish uh, and engage in commerce. We have deep economic relationships with them that are of real value to American consumers. This is what President Trump's trade negotiations are about. He wants that to be fair. He wants that to be reciprocal. He wants American businesses to have a fair shake when we deal with China, not have to worry that if they do a deal, they're going to give up the seed corn of their business. The president made a big deal of the fentanyl uh, agreement with, with the Chinese, uh, that they are going to uh, promise that they're going to class, uh, classify all classes of fentanyl. Let's watch this closely and tell me what your thoughts are here, because I guess there was one issue that the Chinese said that fentanyl is used in a lot of things, including fertilizer. How do you make sure that fentanyl is not coming over the border? Because isn't this the, the synthetic precursor for opioids? It is. Uh, this is a very important issue. The commitment that President Xi made to Trump was a very important commitment. Now China needs to follow through on it. We've seen some progress, some uh, administrative progress inside of China. We hope they'll deliver on this. You know, the president's down at the border today. Uh, one of the elements of the crisis that's down there, we see it in the human suffering that takes place along the border that President Trump is so focused on. But he's also focused on narcotics, uh, drugs that are coming across the country. This fentanyl that comes from China often is trafficked through Mexico across that very border. It's one more reason we have to get control of the crisis that's at our border today. Yeah, let me ask you about the border, because the president is planning to cut hundreds of millions of dollars in aid to these three Central American countries in retaliation for what he's calling their lack of help in cutting the flow of migrants uh, to the U.S. border. What's your take on this? I mean, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, already very weak countries, foreign assistance programs are critical for them. Is this going to work? Is this another threat, or how significant is this? Maria, uh, many of the illegal crossers today, those who are coming across our border illegally today, are coming from the three northern triangle countries, Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. Uh, we've been working with those countries, State Department, uh, DHS have been working with those countries. There are two pieces to their effort. One is will. Are they willing to help us? Are they willing to stop people from leaving the country? The second is capacity. We've given them hundreds of millions of dollars over the past years to create the capacity for them to do so. They have not demonstrated the will, the willingness to actually engage in stopping these caravans from coming across their border. Our mission, uh, by telling them that this aid will be conditioned on the change in their behaviors to convince them that they ought to have the will, that they need to try, they need to work at it. We'll work with them to build out their capacity to do so, but we have not yet seen enough demonstration of their commitment to actually preventing these folks from crossing into Mexico and making this dangerous trek across Mexico and then coming unlawfully into the United States. Well, well, there are a lot of uh, pushback around this from the administration because the number of apprehensions are soaring. Why has the number increased so much? Is the word getting out that the yeah. U.S. has porous, boor, uh, porous uh, borders? Let's go there now and let's make believe we're families? Yeah, I think, I think it's always about incentives. <laughs> Right? What's the risk? Uh, what's the cost? And then what's the opportunity when they come into the United States? What's their opportunity versus what they're facing wherever it is they live, whether that's in Mexico or in the Northern Triangle? Uh, Mexico tried to keep them in Mexico by providing some forms of visas. I think that created a further incentive for them to leave uh, Guatemala or Honduras or El Salvador and go to Mexico. And then they realized they wanted to make the transit into the United States. Uh, we, we have to stop that. We have to control our border. President Trump's going to go down there today and talk about the tools that we have at our disposal to do that. What we ultimately need is Congress to change the laws so that we can return these individuals who 
aren't here properly under asylum back to the country from which they came. Yeah, the president's using every leverage point that he can, and I, and I get that. He's talking now about tariffs on cars uh, coming out of Mexico, but, but does that contradict with the USMCA deal? I mean, you know, we had Senator Capito here earlier, uh, Capito, rather, pardon me, and, and she said, look, you know, I'm going to support this deal, but I know that a lot of Democrats have come on this program and said, we're not going to support it. Now the president's talking about new tariffs on cars coming out of Mexico. We are trying to create the conditions at the border uh, that will keep Americans safe, that will reassert American sovereignty along our southern border. The president is using every tool in his kit. He's also trying to convince Congress to take this threat seriously. We've now seen uh, members of Congress from both sides of the aisle acknowledge the crisis, acknowledge that we are now in the thousands of people coming across that border each day with narcotics and trafficking uh, and persons also coming across that border. What we need, Congress, once they've recognized their crisis, we need them to change. These are simple changes to the law. They could do them today. They need to move. It's time. This crisis, the American people aren't going to stand for this, and President Trump is using every tool in his kit to try and change the incentives, change the behavior so that we can reduce the risk here in the United he States. He sure is, and the president is also using the tariffs threat quite effectively with the Chinese. Do you expect that the president will likely leave those tariffs in place that are currently there for, for China? I think he's hoping what he gets is a real deal, an enforceable deal, along not just the amount of trade to make that fair and reciprocal and important component, but also to protect uh, from uh, illegal uh, theft of intellectual property, technology transfer that is forced. If he gets that size of deal, I'm confident the president will say that's fair. Our tariffs are equal. We're operating in a reciprocal trading arrangement. Let's go and compete and uh, have a great relationship commercially between our two countries. On, on the IP theft, the White House economic advisor, Larry Kudlow, uh, this, this week said that China is finally acknowledging the issues around intellectual property uh, theft. This is the first time they're doing this, I think so, because they were consistently denying that they were even stealing, right? It's a, it's a good first step. It doesn't seem like much right. uh, to you and I to acknowledge something that is patently true that we've known about for decades, but no president was prepared to take on. But yes, their acknowledgement that there's a problem, that this is happening, is a good first step, because absent that, if they don't understand what's happening, won't acknowledge that, uh, that it's really hard to fix and it is impossible to enforce. And so uh, I, they've made real progress. There's still work to do. It's why the president said yesterday, we don't have a time just set to resolve this, um, but the team is hard at work, and we hope China is negotiating in good faith to get to the right resolution. How worried are you about the agricultural situation, the fact that there's swine flu going on there, the fact that China produces and consumes 50 percent of the world's pork, and yet 20 percent of their hogs are diseased? Yeah, it's, a, it's a real challenge for China. Uh, they have real risk that they'll have uh, a supply shortfall. Uh, we hope we get an opportunity to sell good old Iowa hogs and hogs from the United States of America. Yeah, I think they've in, got 100 this. million dead hogs yeah. to dispose of. It's pretty extraordinary. Mr. Secretary, I want you to stay with us because you have been doing such an incredible job across the world. You said at the start of your term you wanted to get the State Department swagger back. You certainly have. And yet one group is dissing you this morning. We're going to come back and talk about that. 